in my award-winning film Horse Soldiers of 9-11, narrated by actor Gary Sinise, I had the beginning of that original mission to go after Osama bin Laden, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda. I tracked down those special operations forces and CIA operatives who represent the Alpha, or the beginning of that mission. And I knew as a war reporter that I had to follow through, that it was important to get the end, or the Omega, of that mission, which I did with the shooter, the former SEAL Team 6 member who shot Osama bin Laden. I only shared a tiny bit and only after he himself publicly released his own name, which I explained in my CNN exclusive to Anderson Cooper. So these are excerpts from multiple conversations you had with Rob O'Neill over the past year and a half. How'd you get access to him? What, what was the, the reason he was talking to you? Thank you, Anderson. First, let me just say that I think people like Rob and his fellow special operators, the SEAL community, they are out there right now taking care of business, going after bad guys in very dangerous locations, and I think they are heroes. So strange for me to call him Rob because I had always said that I would never call him anything other than the shooter. Being able to have some sort of a platform in the future, working on a story or something that would help bring some closure to the families of 9-11, to the victims okay. and to combat veterans overseas. All right, I want to play these comments from him. Even like on the helicopter ride in for the Bin Laden raid, when we knew we were going to die, we didn't do it for us. We did it, we did it for the people that didn't want to die, but they chose to, you know? Did you so actually have that going through yeah, head. we all talked about it. Really? Before the mission? We talked I mean, about like before the three days launching. before the three days between the time we were we were given the green light and we launched. So those two and a half days, whatever it was, we talked about it and we knew we were going to die. But mindfully, you all talked about 9-11 and stuff. I mean, was oh, this, no, we talked what, about was this about like the way the, sense the, of the, the way we put it was the single mom who went to work on a Tuesday morning and later a few minutes later decided to jump instead of burning to death and her last gesture of human dignity was straightening out her skirt and then she jumped you know it's like that's why we went for her but was all of this i mean mindfully talking no about it was, yeah there's no way we're talking about yeah. now yeah. i mean well you have to pump yourself up to go die yeah so we would talk about this but right? it was like to to get your guys's head in the right place we didn't need it in the right place right we just need we just wanted the re-justification that this is it and we're gonna die but we're gonna die when the house blows up but knowing that that was the first time the world heard the shooter's voice, and in his own words. And while the former SEAL Team 6 member uses colorful language, he makes valid points. It was real, it was authentic, and it brought closure to the families and victims of 9-11. It also helped combat veterans with post-traumatic stress. So as a reporter, to get the full alpha and omega, literally the start and finish to that 10-year mission to get Osama bin Laden, which began and ended with special operations forces, that's history. And speaking of history, new chapters keep unfolding in that original horse soldiers mission. In my investigation called Taliban Capture and Release, I reveal the story behind the special forces capture of one of the Taliban five, released for POW, Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl. I persuaded the secretive operators to go on the record, to react to that high-risk detainee's exchange for Bergdahl, and to assess whether that Taliban leader will attack U.S. interests again. One of those Green Berets who helped capture Mullah Mohammed Fossil is now a counter-terrorism head for the White House National Security Council, who worked behind the scenes on the Bergdahl exchange. I'm comfortable with the, the restrictions that the Qataris have placed upon him and these other detainees that have been released. And again, I, I don't think there's gonna be much likelihood that they're gonna get back into Afghanistan anytime before that year is out. Well, let me ask you this regarding Qatar. Do you think that they will be able to properly monitor Fazl mm -hmm. and the rest of these detainees so that they don't either A, escape, or B, are able to establish kind of a, a outside operating base to attack U.S. interests? Mm -hmm. I think the Qataris are more than capable of keeping an eye on these guys and, and upholding their end of the bargain. In my exclusive, you discover Mullah Fazl's connection to convicted American Taliban Johnny Walker Lind and CIA agent Mike Spann, the first American killed in action in the war in Afghanistan. 
You also learn of Mullah Fazl's ties to the former notorious warlord, General Abdul Rashid Dostum, who is now the vice president of Afghanistan. My exclusive made the front page of the Washington Times. The House passed a bipartisan resolution condemning President Obama for negotiating with terrorist groups, and the Senate Armed Services Committee is now investigating the exchange. On a different note, I had the honor of covering President Barack Obama when he praised the elite Army Rangers I was embedded with in my documentary called 9-11 Generation Rangers, which made it to Times Square. These Rangers are battle-hardened, tier one warriors who are rarely seen on camera, but they talked candidly with me before redeploying. President Obama praised the 9-11 generation warriors at the D-Day anniversary in Normandy, comparing their call to serve to that of the greatest generation from World War II. This 9-11 generation of service members, they too felt something. They answered some call. They said, I will go. And for more than a decade, they have endured tour after tour. Among them, Sergeant First Class Corey Remsburg, critically wounded in Afghanistan, who was nationally recognized in the State of the Union Address. And Ranger Chaplain Jeff Strucker of the Black Hawk Down Mission in Somalia. I was embedded with these Rangers and members of the 160th SOAR, the Special Operations Aviation Regiment, when they fast roped out of helicopters and called in AC-130 Spectre gunship support. After my documentary aired, Corey Remsburg's father told me that my video showed Corey's progress and determination after being critically wounded over the five years that I covered the Rangers' story. To me, it reaffirmed what President Obama said. Rangers, Rangers lead, the, lead way. the way. On several combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, while I was embedded with teams, AC-130 gunships provided close air support and cover fire. In my video exclusive called The Spec Ops Gunship That Fights Terrorism, I bring you along for the ride on board an AC-130 Spectre gunship. And all this stuff on the side here that I'm seeing, all these little uh painting scribble stuff that looks like something out of World War II. Yeah, those, uh, those are the fruits of our labor that night. It's the same gunship and crew which took care of the teams I was with on the ground during the fatal shootdown of a Chinook helicopter in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, by Taliban service to air missile. I was supposed to be on that helicopter. That AC-130 mission that night is cited as one of the most challenging and dangerous combat search and rescue operations in all of Operation Enduring Freedom history. I persuaded Air Force Special Operations Command to release the gunship video from that night. Search that tree line. Track the friendlies, please. Tracking the friendlies. Request danger close, 165 meters. Okay, uh, we'll request a danger close. Need your initials. We're going to fire on the compound. Be danger close. Clear me danger close. Roger that. Round's coming down. It shows the crew's decision-making process under fire and how they try to avoid friendlies, children, and animals and strike danger close to the SF teams and infantrymen I was with on the ground that night. As a reporter, I've learned firsthand why Special Forces, Delta, and other government agencies use AC-130 gunships more than anyone else. It's because their missions are mainly direct action with short goals during the night. It's the premier platform for surgical close air support of special operations forces on the ground. Or as one combat controller told me during one mission in Afghanistan, quote, AZ-130s are really good at tracking ground movements and increasing situational awareness. They ran through the wall, you went to, had two of them that went in the compound. Which means taking care of the bad guys faster with less risk to friendlies. Okay, that's another good hit. Air Force Spec Ops Combat Controllers is just one story from one day when I was embedded in Afghanistan with combat controllers and members of the Special Tactics Squadron, when a battle happened right in front of us. Looking for a three-man RPG team. Roger. Great. Three-man three RPG team. Open field. Just north of that uh, last explosion. We just had another 
One of their core missions is to call in close air support, those big guns in the sky, which they did. These air commandos are a small community, numbering only in the hundreds, and they are highly sought after. They attach themselves to special mission units, Green Beret A-teams, and SEALs, Rangers, and MARSOC for operations. That's your target. You're receiving, uh, the receiving, one? yeah, receiving sniper fire from it. My video special shows that combat controllers will continue to be game changers in America's future battles against violent extremist organizations and terrorism, such as ISIS. They're also valuable in coalition partner training, such as in Afghanistan after 2015. And as I witnessed, the focus of these combat controllers and JTACs will continue to be precision, even under extreme circumstances. My role as a war reporter is to try to show all the special forces in the fight, the team effort, the collective mission, including those air assets in the sky supporting those operators that I was embedded with on the ground. Whether it's in a B-1B Lancer covering long range, how they drop bombs onto target after mid-air refueling, or in an A-10 simulator, finding out what it takes when troops in contact ask the pilot to strafe danger close or go Winchester. Or in the front seat of an Apache Longbow helicopter covering close combat attack, or even in the back seat of an F-16 covering forward air control and close air support. As a war reporter, I will Charlie Mike continue the mission as this shrapnel around my neck reminds me to keep trying to tell the stories, the human stories of our special operations forces without releasing any TTPs, techniques, tactics, or procedures. I will do whatever it takes, even if it means doing things like the treacherous Pikes Peak Hill Climb at high speed in a souped up monster truck or racing the dry lake bed of El Mirage, California in a 1932 modified land speed roadster trying to break a record, or climbing Mount Rainier with wounded special operators. All of this in support of our wounded soft warriors and their families. I am humbled by their courage. As a war reporter, I will ethically do whatever I can to keep trying to tell their stories responsibly for history, for their families, and so America doesn't forget.